welcome everyone to class tonight. We are continuing, though we are working our way down through the end of the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. And, uh, Romans is a very important book. It not only deals with strong doctrine, it, is, it also deals with the practical application of the doctrine in our lives. And I made the statement that if you don't get the proper interpretation of the book of Romans, uh, your doctrine everywhere else can be skewed. And so um, it is a very, very key book to us. And so we are in, have enjoyed this book. It has, I pray that the Spirit of the Lord will use this book to help us in our own spiritual growth. So we are at the 17th verse of the 12th chapter of Romans. And it says, repay no one, evil for evil, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And how many know what all means? All. all. Yes. Every, every person. Not just, not just those we like, not just those who like us, not just Christians, but have regard for good things in the sight of everyone. So, note 25. <coughs> the father should not concentrate on the evil, on the evil in others. Now that can be hard sometimes, particularly if you're dealing with a great deal of evil around you. But so don't concentrate on the evil in others. Rather, Paul is telling us in this verse that he or she should focus on doing good. It's really easy to get sidetracked by the evil in others. I mean, I'm sorry. If you're listening to the news, and sometimes I think we should take a news vacation, sometimes you feel like you need to take a news vacation. Because there is just so much evil and so much horrible stuff going on that sometimes that's where your focus is. But it says focus on doing good in spite of the evil around us. Can we make a difference? Yes. Um, how many of you grew up in the church and you were children, or at least the children? Okay, how many remember the, the little song, Right in the Corner Where You Are? Okay, two of us. Okay. What was that? Of course, we sang, Right in the Corner Where You Are, Right in the Corner Where You Are. Because the reality is, you and I, as individuals, cannot change the world. I can't change the world. If I could, I would do it. I just snap my fingers and say, you behave, you behave, you behave, and everything, right? I found out something in my first year of teaching. I couldn't even make, I couldn't even control the whole class at all. But you make a start, and the start is right where we are. In our little area of influence, we can make a difference. So, each one of us, each one of us Christians, need to do something, and we should encourage others around us to aspire to do good, to do good to everyone. In other words, there are people that probably you and I will never know. There are people that you can reach in your little area of influence that I may never even meet this side of Lord. She's on the But you will. There are people that I know that you may never meet. So it's each one of us can touch another life. And that can make all the difference in the world. And then it says, have regard for good things.
good things in the sight of all men. And good things are kala. And this word carries the idea of visibly, that means something able to be seen, visibly and obviously having the right behavior when around others. Does it matter how we behave? Yes. yes. You know what's kind of interesting? <laughs> and I, this is as good time as any to bring this up. Sometimes um, we turn on the, the Christian behavior when we're around Christians. And then when we're not around Christians or we're just just doing something, we act a certain certain way. And, and then uh, it's sometimes it's not the same. And I'm not I'm not I'm not talking Please hear me, I'm not talking that if you're with somebody and you're playing pickleball, you have to go, oh, we have to stop and just praise the Lord right now. I mean, no, that's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about a good behavior. Now, let me, let me tell you some of the experiences I've had. And I'm very, now I'm very careful. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm very careful. Because sometimes, you know, I'm... I'm I love the people in this church. Love the people in this church. So sometimes if I'm out, sometimes someone say, oh, do you know those people? And I'll say, oh yes, they go to my church. <laughs> and then I'll get a remark back, oh, they do. Well, blah, 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 blah. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> now, let me give you a prime example. I have been out at a restaurant and sometimes here's what I get back. Those people go to your church? Now you've got to understand, when I'm in a setting like that, often I invite the people I see to come to our church. Now, actually, and I actually had it the other way around on Sunday. One of the servers I had never met before walked up and says, do you go to such and such a church? I said, no. She said, well, you, look, you two look so familiar. And, the, and then she said where she had been going to church, and, and the situation is now that, I mean, you know that sometimes there's transitions and then what happens, and so she was saying, well, my problem is, we used to have a, a ton of Sunday school classes, you know, for different age groups. And she said, now we're so small that all of the children from, from elementary school to high school are all in the same Sunday school class. How many know that doesn't work? No, you can't. And so she said, I'm wondering, uh, I think I'm gonna get my kids and we're gonna come to Trinity. I said, well, you're welcome, want to know about our programs, and we have, I said, yes. So, that can happen. And that's, that's great. They say, oh, hey, I've moved about your church, okay. But sometimes when people do a certain behavior, guess what, they tell me that too. See, if, if they know, if I said, oh yes, that person attends my church, let me tell you what happens when you don't tip. Guess who hears about it? I do. <laughs> do you know how, no, I, seriously, do you know how embarrassing that is? Because oh, yeah. I've just said, oh, they're Christians. They go to my church. And that may be somebody, and in case, in this case it was, somebody that we've worked with for over two years that just recently recommitted her life to the Lord. I mean, we've had some really good conversations with her now. She says, I'm really feeling the presence of the Lord. So when I get that back, what can I say? 
So, you know, sometimes we don't know the little things we do or don't do can have an effect. That was just a little thing. Or if they are mean or nasty. Yeah. And they'll say, oh, those mean, nasty people go to your church. Oh. You know, there are sometimes I'd like to dig a hole and crawl right in about that. <laughs> but this is what he's talking about. Why? The doctrinal part's been done. Now he's talking about the practical way we live out our Christian lives in front of other people. That doesn't mean we're always perfect, but we should be aware of this. So each one of us should aspire to do good to everyone. Good things are kala. And this word carries the idea of visibly and obviously having the right behavior when we're around others. And kala is interesting because it describes that which is intrinsically. And by that I mean it's just, it's just a part of who you are. It's, the, it's just a part of the inside of you. Excellent. Now when we understand that the Spirit of God indwells us, that's, that's what happened. The, the Spirit has come to live inside of us. And we still have the opportunity to yield to the Spirit living in us, or we have the option of doing what? Doing it our own way. I'll take care of this or we can yield to that spirit flowing out from us. And what we should do, because the spirit living in us is intrins intrinsically excellent. Just, the Holy Spirit doesn't do anything that's not right. And provide some special or superior benefit. See, if, if we are allowing the spirit to flow through us, there'll always be a good benefit there. Because it said, good things in the sight, in the sight. And it's anopian. And this word means in front of, in the presence of, in the face of everyone. And this word, anopian, pertains to exposure of another to a value judgment. In other words, it should be visible. Oh, that, that's a good thing. Now, um, how many, how many, uh, I shouldn't have, but she, no one could say it quite like she could. How many ever watched Martha Stewart? How many know when she'd do something, what she'd say? It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Well, understand what this is saying is that you and I, in living out our lives visibly toward other people, when we are living our lives for Christ, it should be a good thing. They should say, that's a good thing. So Christians are to do things in such a way that everyone can see that he or she, everyone can see it, is honorable. H-O-N-O-R-A-B-L, -O -O, honorable. Now, it's not because we are intrinsically honorable, but we are indwelt by the Spirit of God. When you and I committed our lives to the Lord, the, His Spirit came inside of us and gives us the ability to live honorable lives. I would love to say that I have never, ever seen a Christian do anything dishonorable. I'm not going to go into detail, but I had a so-called Christian do something extremely, say something, and do something today that was extremely dishonorable. By the way, they didn't want to attend this church. But it was horrific. You see, our conduct, what we do, what we plan to do, should bring honor to our God. And isn't that what Jesus said? We should do that. And so that they'll see your good works and what do what? And glorify 
the Father. <coughs> Everything and what we do that is good <coughs> isn't to just get praise for ourselves, right? It's not, oh, you're so wonderful, you're such a great person. No, it's so they will see what you are doing that's good, Kala, and they'll give glory to our, our Heavenly Father. Any questions? How many are determined to say, Lord, I will surrender more to you so that when people look at yes. me, they will give glory to you? Okay, let's look at number 18, verse 18. And hopefully I want to get some discussion on this. If it is possible, and I will tell you that, um, well, uh, I will go into this, but actually, um, as much as depends on you, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, together, live peaceably with all men. Um, the Amplified said, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with everyone. Well, that sounds just about what King, New King James says. The Phillips translation, again, I, I give some of these other uh, versions so that you can, it, because it kind of shades in some of uh, the between the lines meaning. And I like J.B. Phillips. It says, as far as your responsibility goes. You may know that um, we have a responsibility, but we can't go beyond what we can do. As far as your responsibility goes, live at peace with everyone. West says almost the same thing, again, just a little bit differently. He said, if it is possible. But you know, sometimes it's not possible. You can do everything you want to do, and it's not going to be possible. If it is possible, so far as it depends upon you with all men, be living at peace. <coughs> so this is what's important. Can I just say that you can't do the impossible? Because you can't, why? Why, why am I saying you can't do the impossible? Because you can't control somebody else. You're the only, you're the only person that you can decide, I'm not going to do this or I am going to do this. So it's kind of interesting if we look at this word. If possible is the Greek word dunaton. Is there a word, a Greek word, that's, that some of you can remember? Dunamis. Dunamis. And dunamis speaks of what? God's power. And this word refers to power one has by virtue of inherent ability. And inherent resources. So right away, what are you picking up from? It says this, this word re refers to power that you have by virtue of inherent, within you, ability and resources. But you know right away from looking at this word, what? The power and the resources have been available, available made available to you by God. And that's why it can say, you have to look at this qualifying phrase, as much as depends on you, because you can't control somebody else. You may have your God-given ability, but you can't cross over into somebody else's choice. See, some problems with people may never be resolved, never. See, that's where sometimes we as Christians, we think, it's got to be done. I got to get in. This is has to. No. Because you cannot control somebody else. 
Somebody else may throw a temper tantrum. Somebody else may cross the line. And you may do everything you can. But you can't change, you cannot change another person. You cannot. You can't make another person submit to the Lord. You cannot. You may want to. I've often said, if I could get saved for somebody, I would. Yeah. But guess what? We can't. We can't. And just as it takes two to quarrel, it also takes two to reconcile. That's why the word is reconcile. So sometimes it just, it, you can desire that. You can desire to be at peace, but if the other person does not desire to be at peace, there's nothing you can do. Case in point, I mean, not only with individuals, but what? There's a real good example going on right now. And I'm talking about the Middle East. And if you will study the history of the nation of Israel, you know, some of us kind of wish we could go back in time and tell them, don't, don't do that. Yeah. It won't work. Do you understand how many times the nation of Israel has given up land for peace to have nothing but, but war <laughs> and violence? If you study the history, that's what's happened. I know a little bit about it because we were there, well, we've been there, first intifada, the second intifada, but I, re I remember being there. How many remember in this church when we were all wearing the orange bands? How many remember that? Okay, I have one person who's still in there, three of us. Now, what it, the, the orange bands symbolized what happened to people who built their homes in what is today Judea and Samaria and, and Gaza, what is today Gaza. That, that was a part of Israel, given to Israel. Yes. By the way, given to Israel and then Israel paid for the land. And they said, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna make peace. So we are going to give them Gaza and in order to be able to settle them in Gaza, we have to take the settlers who have built homes there, who have businesses there, and they're going to have to be uprooted from there. And we wore the yellow band to say we stand with the settlers. And they did. Now let me tell you what these, these people who came in did. When the settlers were removed, many of them had greenhouses. The time of the year where they just, and many of them, they dragged crying out of their homes. Their loved ones were buried there. That was their home. And in fact, in this recent conflict, one family actually, one soldier actually found the uh, nameplate for their home when he was a little boy. As they were digging the rubble, they found it. He brought it back. Hmm. They had fully filled greenhouses. Now, a smart person, a person who said, okay, we can then build a business off of this because these plants are ready now to put in the ground and we can have a harvest. Do you know what those people did with those greenhouses? They smashed them and destroyed the plants. That's the truth, go check me out. So the problem is you can do everything. You can give up everything. You can try to reconcile, but it takes two to reconcile and if one does not want to reconcile and wants to always be at war until you're no longer in existence, you cannot reconcile. That's why the Apostle Paul says here, if as much as it's your responsibility, because sometimes it's just not gonna work. 
And nothing you can do will ever be enough. Right. And in a situation like that, nothing you can do will be enough. Sometimes in personal relationships. Mm. I mean, you could almost give yourself to be burned for another person, and it's never enough. And sometimes you're going to say, golly, when is it going to be enough? Well, I'm going to tell you something. Unless the two people want it, both of them, or the both groups of people want it, it will never be enough because they don't want the reconciliation. Nevertheless, if we do our part to be at peace with all people, there is a plan to follow. We do not hold on to resentment. And we do not retaliate with the weapon of silence. And this is in interpersonal relationships. But, but sometimes it is necessary to do what? To move on. To move on. <clears throat> because God doesn't want you miserable trying to make peace with someone who doesn't want peace. It's unfortunate, but sometimes when this happens, you're the one that feels guilty that you can't help. That's right. The comment was sometimes when we try to do that, and because it's not successful, we end up being feeling guilty. But there's nothing that says that has to happen. As long as you're doing what the Paul says to do, you don't have to. You don't have to be guilty. Because because the bottom line is, if possible, how many of you know sometimes it's just not possible? It's not possible. Now, Faye, there's, Faye, there's, a, is there a question? Do you, no, I, I missed all that because I just thought you were just talking. Oh. <laughs> well, I was just talking, but I was talking and you gave me the answers. Okay, let me go through 28. I'm gonna go right down through 28, okay? Oh, you, you got them now? Okay. Everybody got all the answers now for 28. I heard it all, I just didn't write Okay, it. let's look at 29. <laughs> Fathers have a power supply. We have a power supply. It is called the Holy Spirit. I, no, I actually, as, as much as it is possible, it's very pos impossible. It's very impossible for me right now to do a little, a, a great deal of concentration. If you're at home, you're not hearing it, I hope. But here we're having, yes. I'm having sound coming in like it's like, there's like something else going on in the classroom right over here that it is, that is as loud as it is in here. And it's a little bit difficult to concentrate. So as, as much as is possible, I would do that, okay. If that is being, is that, if that's teaching, you can fool me. Indwelling us and giving us, and here's the key, can I do it with my own nature? No. So the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us and gives us a new nature. You know what the problem is with a great many people? They have not picked up the new nature. And you can't, you cannot do this with the old nature. The old nature is capable for you. Now we can make a conscious effort, <laughs> and by the way, it has to be a conscious effort. What do I mean when I say conscious effort? Yeah. And deliver. I, I, I choose to do what? I choose to do this. I choose to seek to overcome evil with good. It's a deliberate. It's not, oh, I accidentally stumbled into doing good, overcoming evil. No. I don't think we can ever overcome evil with good by just stumbling into it or accidentally doing it. It has to be a conscious effort and choice. But we can do it, and we can do it because of the enablement of God's Spirit. 
We cannot do it in our own human strength. You can never grit your teeth enough and dig in enough to be able to do this without the help of the Holy Spirit. And when we do so, and please hear me, when we do so, whether we see the issues resolved or not, because we already know sometimes, no matter what you do, you can't make the change. You can change you, but you cannot change somebody else. So whether we see the issues resolved or not, you can still be at peace. How are you at peace? By saying, Lord, you know I did everything I could do. And we can be at peace because we are able to let God work out the problem once we have fulfilled our responsibility. So I think, you know, some people uh, have this idea that, well, everybody has to do this. No, it's not always possible. <laughs> So I want you to keep in mind the qualification which Paul gives, because if you do, you won't put yourself under guilt. Because I know a lot of Christians who put themselves under guilt because everybody's not being nice to each other. So it's not going to happen. So number one, if it be possible, you know, there may come a time when one must submit to the claims of principle. The one thing I will tell you about Christianity, Christianity is not an easygoing belief system which will accept anything. What do I mean by that? And close its eyes to everything. And I really mean this. I mean Christianity. Now, there are a lot of groups of people who call themselves a church or a religious institution, and guess what happens? Anything goes. I mean, not too far from here, there is, let me, let me just say it this way, because I believe the church is the ecclesia, the outcalled ones of God, or the people belonging to God. But there's a building not too far from here, and they have a marquee out in front of their building. And it says, accepted, no exceptions. Please hear me. As far as being accepted to come in so that you can hear the truth of God's word, that's how we feel. You're accepted. You can come in. We don't, we don't throw anybody out who comes in. But here's what you don't do. You do not come in and dictate to us what our belief system is going to be. And say, well, this is my belief system, and you have to, well, you're welcome to come. You're welcome to hear the word of God. You're welcome to allow the spirit of God to change you. But don't bring in your belief system contrary to the word of God. So how many know not everything does go? There, there, there are some things in this word of God that says, hey, this doesn't. There's a change. There's a change that occurs. Now, does it all happen at once? No. I actually was having kind of a humorous conversation with someone today. Um, we're talking about you know, Christians. And, um, you know, there are Christians at different development levels, right? And I was talking about, and so we were talking, and I said, you know, some Christians are like James and John. James and John. And some of you are probably going to know exactly where I'm going. Remember G James and John, well, disciples of Jesus. And so Jesus was, you know, doing his ministry. 
And there were people that uh, decided uh, they, would, they could do that too, and they were out doing that. And James and John looks at Je look, look at Jesus, and they said, would you like for us to call down fire from heaven? Yeah. I mean, how many know that sometimes there are Christians that are the called down fire from heaven people? And then what did Jesus have to do? No, no. If they're, if they're, if they're not against me, just leave them alone. <coughs> so they had to grow. Now, what's really interesting about that, if you know anything about James, James was, of course, martyred for the cause of Christ, and John became known as what? The apostle of love. From wanting to call down fire from heaven and kill a bunch of people, he became the apostle of love. How many of you know that there's a growing process, there's a refining process? Of course, none of you ever wanted to call fire down from heaven, on anyone, right? Of course. I can think of a few locations. <laughs> but there may come a time when one must submit to the claims of principle. Christianity is not an easy belief system. We don't close our eyes to everything. There will be times when we must, and here's the key, we must stand up to truth and take a stand. I believe that right now is one of the times when the Christian church needs to take up a stand, no matter what anybody says, and say we're going to stand with God's natural people. And if you don't like that, we're sorry. But we are going to take a stand. And I am so encouraged to hear of, of Christians in, in nations that have already turned their back on Israel that say, but well, we want you to know the church, the church in Australia, the church in South Africa that have brought the charges in the International Criminal Court against Israel, the church in South Africa says we stand with Israel. And that's encouraging. There are other things that the church needs to take a stand on. And we need to be willing to do that. And there's a time to take a stand. I don't believe that, that Jesus calls willy-nilly people. I believe he calls people and gives us a backbone to take a stand. Paul also says, as much as it depends on you. And another way, if you, if you look at this in the Greek, it means as far as you can. How many know that sometimes we can do more than we do, and then there's sometimes we try to do more than it's, it, we're able to do? As far as you can. Now, Paul knew that it is easier to live at peace with some people and not so easy to do with other people, right? Or do y'all, I mean, there are just some people it's easier to go on with. Um, there are some people in an apartment with me that's really easy to get along with. And there are some people in an apartment building where it's not so easy to get along. Sometimes you would like to, I said you would like to, but you don't. You'd like to push them out a window and tell them God they fell. <laughs> now, by the way, I learned that from one of my teachers, instructors in Bible college. She said, now you all know that there are people you'd like to push out a window and tell God they fell. <laughs> but you don't do that. None of us do that. Well, I hope we don't do that. You may tell them to jump out a window, but you but it is, and when we understand this, realizing this, I believe keeps us both from criticism and discouragement. First of all, it will keep us from criticizing. Oh, I just, I can't, I just can't do it. It's just Christianity is too hard. How can I be, just do all this. And also keeps us from discouragement, saying I just can't do it. Well. He didn't say you had to do it, the impossible. 
He said, as far as you can, as long as it's possible. Don't get discouraged about it, because the bottom line is there are some people, you could, you could do anything and they still don't want to live at peace. Now, what does it mean where it says live peaceably? It says live peaceably. If possible, live peaceably. Well, I like this. And right away you see irene, irene, which is what? It is the Greek word for what? It's not hard. It's not impossible to know what this word is. Peace. Peace. Remember when we looked at, remember when Jesus said, peace I give to you, peace I leave with you, and we looked at that word irene? So this is irene nuantes, peaceably. And this is an exhortation which should be obeyed. Now, can you live peaceably in your own strength? No. No. So it is an exhortation which should be obeyed, that's true, but how? By the spirit-controlled faith. It can only be done by the spirit-controlled faith. Now, by the way, this live peaceably is in the present tense. And that declares that this should be our continual mindset and lifestyle. In other words, it should be ongoing, it should be our lifestyle. And here's why it needs to be our lifestyle and ongoing. In the heat of a moment, guess what? It's too difficult. But if that is our lifestyle, if, if, if every day we give our lives in, into the control of the Holy Spirit, and that's our lifestyle, Lord, help me, help me to, to live peaceably, help me to be a peacemaker. Um, then what happens is it's a whole lot easier than if you're waiting right in, your, in the midst of a hot situation and then you want to live in, oh, I need to, I need to have peace. No, it's, it's a little late then. So we have to develop that. And I'm not sitting here telling you it's easy and it's done all the time. I had, a very, I had a very good example in my father. My father <coughs> literally was the peacemaker both on his side of the family and on my mother's side of the family. And I'm here to tell you, I'm not there yet. Strive for that. And I know my mother said that to me. She said, she said I'm not where your father is but I want to be. And he went through, by the way, you think, oh, well, he just went to bed one night and woke up like this. No. <laughs> it, was, it was something that took a long time to develop until he just totally surrendered and allowed that, the Lord to, to bring that peace in him to bring to us. But giving ourselves over into the Spirit's control. See, doing what is right, I said, well, I'm going to do right. Well, doing what's right may or may not result in peace. See, to believe that if I do what's right, it's always going to turn out in peace, that's a la land. <clears throat> now, why do I say that? Because the one thing God does not do is God will not come down and do what? Overtake free will. Now, we may yield, understand something, we may yield to the direction of the Holy Spirit. The person we're dealing with may not. And God's not going to come down 
and take their free will from them. If they want to be a devil on wheels, he's not going to remove their free will. He'll give, if they'll surrender, he'll do what? He'll save them, deliver them, give them peace, but he's not going to just take away their free will. Why? Because God made that decision when he created man. And so, if you and I do what is right, it may or not, may, may, it may result in peace. It may mean such that the person will be touched. But peace should always be our goal or aim. Peace should be our goal. Live in peaceably with all people as much as is possible. Now, in the body of Christ, now I'm talking about specific the body of Christ. When a brother or sister has offended us, or we have offended him or her, we should be dedicated to working toward a peaceful resolution of the matter. And that should take place. Why do I mean? Why? Because here's a different situation. We're talking about two believers. But there, even again, you all, you still go back to as much as as is possible, as much as it depends on you. But if you got two believers, it should be able to be resolved. Please okay. Questions, comments. I know Paul's getting down into the nitty gritty now. I can feel it. <laughs> I can feel it. Okay, let's look at verse 19. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now the Amplified says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves. So in other words, in the Greek, because the Amplified takes the Greek and just and translates it directly. But leave the way open for God's wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay or requite, says the Lord. J.B. Phillips' translation says, Never take vengeance into your own hands, my dear friends. Stand back and let God punish if he will. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. West says, Do not be avenging yourselves, beloved ones, but give place at once to the wrath. For it stands written, To me belongs punishment, I will repay, says the Lord. I think I shared this with you before, but one of my instructors at Mount Vernon Bible College, Miss Gamble, uh, said this. She said, you know, if we live long enough, and I really only think we have to live very long before, what? We will be hurt, wounded, something bad done to us. And she said, if you will listen to what the Lord says about, just leave it in my hands. She said, I really believe the day can come where you will actually pray, Lord, enough, enough. It wasn't quite that bad. And she said, it's way better than you trying because you never can do what God can do. And here I'm very old. That was a long, long time ago that she said that. There are just certain things that I remember that my instructors said that I still remember that are, that are just really statements by which I live my life. I remember them to this day that she made that statement. Now, when she made that statement, I'm certain many of us sitting there, including yours truly, 
were sitting there saying, I don't think, I don't think I'd ever feel that. I don't think I'd ever experience that, right? Because when people really do you in, you think, oh, I don't think I'd ever say, no, no, Lord, <laughs> it's enough. But I can tell you, I have. That comes, what, the more we yield to the Spirit of the Lord, the more we give in to the Lord. So, yeah, and there are still some times, just don't cut me off. I almost wrecked my car. If you drive here in this town, it's um, So, he calls them beloved. And this word beloved is agapatoi. And I think, obviously, you see a certain Greek word there, and probably you all know what it is. It's agape. And this word means dear, very much, very much loved. Paul is writing this to the church at Rome, a church that was made up of both Gentiles and Jewish believers. And, and we know what happened to Paul in Rome. The church, he loved them, very, very much loved. And uh, agape toy is love called out of one's heart. It's not just, I love you. I love you, love you too. No, this, this is a very deep, selfless love, sacrificial love. It's called out of the heart. It, it is called out by the preciousness of the object love, or in this case, the people. And so he said, beloved, I love you. I love you so much. And in scripture, agapetoi is used only, and please hear me, only of Christians. Now, that means something. Right away, if you understand that this is a love word that is only ever in Scripture used of Christians, then this must be a very special love. Right away, it tells you something. It tells you that it is only used of Christians as united with God or with uh, each other in love. It also tells you that this, this love, agape, has only one source, God. Agape only has one source, God. You can't drum up agape. I can't, I can't manufacture it. I can't pretend agape, because the source is, only comes from God. The only one that can put in our hearts agape love is God. So he basically he's saying what? You are loved of God. And God has put love in you. So do not avenge yourselves. Avenge. Ek de contes. And this word means exactly <coughs> that. To avenge, to take revenge. To inflict pain or injury in retaliation for an injury <coughs> or an insult or offense received. You hit me, I'll hit you back in the heart. You hurt me, I'll hurt you worse. You know, Christians must be free from the desire to get even. You may have ever heard that this phrase, revenge is best served cold, which means I'll wait. But they're at least expecting it. I'll just jam it in there. Well, Christians should be free from that. And fathers should view insults and injuries as momentary. I mean, oh, they come, they go. 
light, L-I-G-H-T, afflictions, that produce an eternal weight of glory. Now I'm here to tell you that how we should view things and how we do sometimes are two different things. I mean, that's difficult. Because there, there, there are some people that can really mm, just insult us, right? Yes. And now, I'm just, I, I'm just telling you that right now we live in a culture and society that are always doing this to Christians. You know, there, let's face it, if we, if we go back 50 years ago, if, if people knew you were a Christian, you probably thought, that was a, that's, that's pretty nice. That's a nice Christian lady. That's a nice Christian gentleman. Yeah. It's not the case today. All the Christians, they're all the problems. They, call, they create all the problems. Christians need to stay out of this. Christians need to stay out of that. And when you hear some of the insults against Christians, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, those insults and injuries uh, are hurtful. And sometimes you just want to say, well, you're not so great yourself. And sometimes it's, hey, you're the ones causing all the trouble in our culture. Now please hear me. Don't go out of here thinking I've arrived because I'm standing, sitting here telling you. I'm, I have to do the same thing I'm telling you the word says. I'm just telling you the word says this for all of us. For me, for you. We should view them as momentary. And by the way, they are. I'm sorry. Somebody insults you and calls you all sorts of names. And believe me, I've been called that. Well, I've been called a holy roller. I got, first of all, I'm still working on being set apart. And other thing, I don't know that I've ever rolled. <laughs> unless I fell down and rolled. And I did do that. I fell off a lap in my kitchen. But they're momentary. And so are the injuries. That Yeah, they hurt for a period of time. But how many can be honest enough to say this? You may have been insulted five years ago. Tonight you unless you really dig it up, you don't even remember it. I want us to look at 2 Corinthians 7, chapter 7. I've given you the reference there. You can go back there and go to it. Read it. 2 Corinthians 4. I said 7, I'm sorry, 4. 17 and 18. And uh, I happen to know that this was someone's favorite, someone, someone's mother's favorite scripture. For our light affliction, now I will stop here for a minute. Paul is writing. But obviously Corinthians as well. What are some of the things that Paul suffered? Persecution. Persecution. He, he was talked about. Uh, remember what? He was put in prison. Remember he had to be let down and escape in a basket to escape. They were going to kill him. He was scourged. He was beaten and, beaten and stoned and left for dead. And he writes, for our light affliction, how many sitting in front of me would call that light affliction? Yeah, I'm not seeing anyone say yes. And yet he says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. And remember what they did when Paul and Silas were in prison? They did what? Was it, they were in the darkest part of the prison. They were put in stocks even after they had been beaten. So they couldn't even touch the part of their body that hurt. This is, uh, which is but 
for a moment. Now, but for a moment in comparison to what? Eternity. Do you understand when we're in heaven, I think when we're in heaven, after we've been in, in, in well, heaven for a year, because we're going to be in heaven seven years before we come back, or a thousand years to live on this earth. So let's say, I think by the first year in heaven, anything we experienced here, And by, by the time we're, we are a hundred years into the millennium, what, what insult, what injury, what lie that was said about me? For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Why? Because we realize something. Every time they tell a lie on me, that's another brick in my bed. Because one day the wicked will cease from giving us trouble. The wicked will cease from trouble. The weary, ever get weary of what we're living in? But the weary will what? Be at rest. Yes. Because all of the saints of the ages will sit at his feet. That's why Paul could say, well, this little light affliction. Well, when we're going through, it doesn't seem light. But in comparison to the glory of God that is waiting us, it's really light. Yeah. While we do not look at the things which are seen, that's, that's the stuff we go through, right? But at the things which are not seen, or the things which are seen are temporary. Temporary. Hallelujah. But the things which are not seen, <clears throat> but they're waiting for us, are eternal. So as followers of Jesus, we see these negative experiences from an eternal perspective. And when we see them from an eternal perspective, rather than a temporal perspective, then we say, the man does not matter. Comments, questions? Ever had a trial? Ever had an insult? Ever had? <laughs> yes. But guess what? In comparison to what is awaiting us eternally, Paul says you can just call it a light affliction. No. It has to do with what? Our perspective. So we're going to stop there at 36. And next week we will have class. So we will have class. Yeah, we are going to have class next week. And then we will not have class on the 12th and the 19th. So two weeks. If you are watching from a distance and watching at home, uh, there will not be a class for you on the 13th and the 20th. So I just want to make you aware of that. So if you get on online and you're trying to find us, we will not be here the 13th and the 20th. So we will then be back on the very next week. We love you. If you want to give in response to the teaching that you received, you can do so online. You can do it by mailing in your, your gift. You can, if you're local, you can drop it off in the drop box in the lobby of the church. If you have a prayer request, we'd love to pray for you. If you have a comment or a question that you would like for us to answer, we will answer them. And if there's anything that we can do for you, don't hesitate to let us know. We are praying for you. If you are local and you would love to come and be in class in person, we would definitely love to have you. Uh, some of you that have been out for a long time, we miss you. 
and we'd love to have you in person in class. So pray about it, let us know, and we will make sure to make room for you in the class. We will be looking at you and going back into the Book of Romans this time next week. And may the Lord bless you real good.